little bird has something unusual on his farm in southeast Missouri. It's a special place. Not quite dry land, not quite open water. A place where ancient trees and damp vegetation evoke images of a more primitive time. A place where a unique combination of water, soil and plants have given birth to a fragile yet dynamic ecosystem. He owns a fragment of a vanishing natural resource in Missouri, a wetland. Well, this farm belonged to my grandfather, James Lanier Bird, and was passed on to my father, Thomas A. Bird. It's been in the family since the early 1900s, and uh, it was always my childhood favorite farm because of the woods down here. My grandfather probably didn't clear because it was 12 miles from Charleston where he lived and it was hard to get down here. He had to come down here on horseback and uh, it was just the area that he couldn't get to that easily or I think it would have been uh, cleared. If they had preserved the old wetlands, I think uh, they were beautiful. If, if you like swamps, to some people, swamps are nothing but a place for mosquitoes and to be drained and cleared, but uh, there's a beauty to a swamp that uh, no highland area can quite copy as far as I'm concerned. When Hugh Bird's great-grandfather arrived in southeast Missouri 100 years ago, he encountered a much different landscape than the one we are familiar with. In his day, more than two million acres of forested wetlands existed in the flat, low-lying areas associated with the boot heel, which often received flood water from the mighty Mississippi. These wetlands were linked to an extensive network of other wetland complexes extending northward along the floodplains and major streams and rivers throughout the Midwest. The vast majority of these wetlands were federally owned. At the time of our nation's settlement, Missouri had 4.8 million acres of swamps, marshes, floodplain forests, fens, and wet prairies, areas we now call wetlands. To the early settlers, wetlands were undesirable places because the waterlogged soils, trees, and other vegetation were not suited for farming and development. In those days, only the hunters and trappers placed an economic value on wetlands. In the mid-1800s, Congress enacted legislation that had a profound impact upon wetlands and the Missouri landscape. It passed the Swamp Land Acts, which granted title to 64 million acres of wetlands to the 15 states in which they were located. But there was a catch. The land had to be reclaimed. Reclamation generally meant getting rid of the water and the vegetation by clearing, draining, and filling. The timber industry was the first to profit from the newly acquired forested wetland swamps. Lumbermen began harvesting the huge virgin stands of cypress, water tupelo, and other bottomland hardwood trees. It was hard work for men with primitive crosscut saws. They were pitted against trees of enormous girth, which in many places stood in soft, mucky soil and in a foot or more of water. With the advent of steam-powered machinery, reclamation became considerably easier, and the water which fed the wetlands in the boot heel was eliminated through the construction of drainage ditches and flood levees. Throughout the years, additional Missouri wetlands have been lost to the building of railroads and highways, stream channelization, real estate development, clearing and draining for agriculture, and the building of dikes for commercial navigation. Today, less than 450,000 acres of Missouri's original 4.8 million acres of wetlands remain statewide, and most survive only as fragments of their larger, now vanished parent complexes. Today, as Hugh Bird introduces the next generation of the Bird family to their natural heritage, Missourians are working statewide to preserve and restore the diversity of the wetland fragments that remain.
wetlands are areas where the presence of water results in distinctive soil development that nourishes unique communities of plants and animals. Healthy wetlands teem with a great variety of life and function in ways that we are only now beginning to understand. Missouri wetlands are fed by the fresh water of inland rivers and streams, the runoff from rainfall events and from the groundwater. Many of Missouri's original wetlands were concentrated along the two great rivers which flow through the state, the Mississippi and the Missouri. Equally important are the state's 48 other major streams, the climate, the geology, and rainfall that ranges between 36 and 48 inches per year. This combination has created Missouri's impressive diversity of wetlands, which include forested swamps, shrub swamps, marshes, wet meadows, fens, and forested wetlands. Except for forested swamps, these wetlands can be found scattered throughout the state in both rural and urban areas. Forested swamps are limited to southeast Missouri because of the natural geographical range of the trees that grow there. These swamps are characterized by shallow water during most of the year and the presence of bald cypress and tupelo trees, which are the only trees that can tolerate the long periods of flooding and ponding. These species of trees have very distinctive trunks that are swollen around the base. The knobby projections around the cypress trees are commonly called knees and are thought to help the cypress get oxygen during saturated conditions. One of the best places to explore the diversity of Missouri wetlands is at Pershing State Park. This 2,400-acre park along Locust Creek in Lynn County features nearly every wetland type that once existed in northern Missouri. Dan Files, the park superintendent, has studied the complex and knows it well. Here at Pershing State Park, we are protecting one of the few relatively undisturbed wetland complexes within the state. By relatively undisturbed, I mean that the water which feeds the system is still intact, which in this case is an actively meandering river. Of the 2,700 acres within Pershing State Park, there's a dynamic mixture of wetland types. This, for instance, is a shrub swamp. Unlike the cypress and tupelo swamps found in Boot Hill, shrub swamps are dominated by shrubs and not trees. Buttonbush is a common plant here. You may also find hibiscus and willow. It is around the edges of swamps or lakes and man-made reservoirs that marshes are most likely to be found. In a marsh, water is not usually present as often or as long as it is in a swamp. People often think of marshes as nothing more than cattail ponds, but healthy marsh systems will have a variety of plant species. Reed canary grass, bulrush, spike rush, arrowhead, smartweed, and sedges are plants that may be found in a healthy marsh. Another distinct type of wetland is the forested wetland, sometimes called a floodplain or riparian wetland. Pin oak, silver maple, bur oak, swamp white oak, cottonwood, and pecan are trees typical of wetland forests. Forested wetlands like this one may not fit the mental picture some people have of wetlands. That's because they are not usually subjected to long periods of flooding. During the winter and spring months, they may appear to be saturated, ponded, or flooded, but during the summer, they're dry. Forested wetlands are particularly important in Missouri because they function as valuable buffer zones that moderate the impacts of flooding and prevent contaminants carried by runoff from entering our streams and rivers. Susan Hazelwood, a member of Missouri's Wetland Advisory Council, is concerned with the public perception of wetlands. A common misperception about wetlands is that they're underwater all the time. The permanent deep open water that you have in the center of a lake or a reservoir is not a wetland. Instead, wetlands occur at the border of the lake or the reservoir where you have plants growing in response to the changing levels of the water. Basically, it's how much water is present, when it's present, and for how long it's present that determines the type of wetlands that will occur. Because wetlands are not underwater all the time, and because it is not easy to recognize 
the chemical and biological changes that are occurring in the plants and the soils, some people find it difficult to recognize some sites as wetlands. Another illustration of the fact that wetlands aren't always underwater is the wet meadow. The hydrology, or water conditions that affect wet meadows, is similar to that of forested wetlands. However, wet meadows are characterized by a variety of sedges, grasses, and forbs. This type of wetland is more dependent upon saturated soils than flooding or ponding of surface water. The reason for the difference in vegetation between the wetland forest and the wetland meadow here is the historic influence of fire. Periodic fires once swept the plains of Missouri, eliminating tree dominance. This gave grasses, sedges, forbs, and other herbaceous plants the opportunity to thrive. Today, park staff preserve this wet meadow through the use of controlled burns, which keeps it healthy and reproductive. Most people find it hard to imagine wetland vegetation burning, a fact which underscores just how little we understood in former decades about the complexity of wetland systems and the adaptations of their plant life. Doug Ladd, a biologist for the Nature Conservancy, is studying how wetlands function and has a special interest in Missouri's rarest type of wetland, the fen. Well, a fen is simply a, a special kind of wetland where all the water comes from water from underground as opposed to water from the surface, and that water has flowed before it emerges into the fen in, through rocks that have some sort of mineralization and the water flowing through the underground rocks dissolves the minerals so the water that comes up in the fen is groundwater that's rich in minerals and that's what makes a fen. It's a wetland where the the groundwater is rich in minerals and because it's flowed underground for a period of hours or days or weeks it's also the same temperature as underground which here in Missouri is about 56 degrees. Because you've got these special water conditions you get a special place for plants that like to grow with their feet wet all the time and what you get here are a bunch of species of plants which either are adapted to and can tolerate or maybe even require constant temperature, constant supply of mineral rich groundwater. And especially that mineral component appears to create conditions that favor a bunch of plants that don't grow anywhere else this far south in the world except in fen systems. Fens are an important component of the Missouri wetland complex because many of the species that occur in fens only occur in fens in Missouri. Missouri fens are small, usually one-half to five acres in size. Fens are a good example of how size is not necessarily related to importance. Some of Missouri's most valuable wetlands are quite small. Large or small, wetlands are astonishingly productive. The unique combination of water, soil, and vegetation found in wetlands creates the very basis of the food chain. Wetlands are nurseries for many species of fish and provide cover, food, and critical habitat for a diversity of other animals. This habitat is especially important for rare and endangered species, which rely on wetlands for survival. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is particularly interested in the rare and endangered species found within the wetland environment. Wetlands are transitional areas between upland habitats and aquatic habitats or deep water habitats. The diverse vegetation in and around wetlands provides a good habitat for a variety of animal species. Of the, of the federally listed endangered species nationwide, fully 43% of them are dependent on wetlands during some form of their life function. Currently in Missouri there are 22 federally listed species, of which 19 are dependent on wetlands during some time during their life cycle. This is a forested area along a stream. This is a, would be a good area for one of the listed species, the Indiana bat. The Indiana bat winters six months out of the year in caves in Missouri, and the other six months spend almost their entire time along streams like this with repairing forests. These areas are important because the bat uses the trees for nursery colonies. Because 90% of Missouri's wetlands have been drained, the remaining 10% of the wetlands are very important for rare and endangered species, both federally and state endangered. Wetlands are essential to humans as well. We are just now beginning to understand the relationships between wetlands and water quality. Jane Epperson, 
A hydrologist for the Missouri Department of Natural Resources is involved in the study of the values and functions of wetlands. One of the reasons wetlands are important to people is because of their ability to actually improve the quality of the water that flows through them. Wetlands accomplish this through a series of complex chemical and biological reactions. But basically, the microorganisms that live in and around the soil, water, and plants of a wetland can break down some pollutants into less harmful elements. As part of their normal growth process, some wetland plants take up excess nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus and convert them into food for the building of tissue. All natural wetlands have this ability to one degree or another. Wetlands located in flood plains or along the shorelines of streams and lakes are extremely important because they act as buffer zones, capturing contaminants from the water before it flows into our rivers, streams and lakes. These polluted waters, which cannot be traced back to a single source, such as a pipe, are called non-point source pollutants. A variety of chemicals and excess nutrients from both rural and urban areas get picked up as rainwater flows across the land surface and runs off into adjacent water bodies. Wetlands can act as filters for these kind of pollutants, thereby benefiting the quality of our surface and groundwater resources. Wetlands can also improve water quality by removing ordinary sediments from the water. Fast-moving water slows down when it enters the normally flat-lying, densely vegetated wetland area. This reduction in water speed causes the sediment being carried by the water to drop out and settle to the bottom of the wetland. Recent studies have demonstrated that those wetlands that are only occasionally flooded are particularly efficient in trapping sediment and nitrogen, which are two of the leading water pollutants. Slowing down the water also helps reduce erosion and flood damages. With two major rivers, the Missouri and the Mississippi, and more than 4,000 other streams and rivers in the state, flood damage reduction is pretty important to Missourians. Many of our remaining wetlands are in river floodplains, serving as natural overflow areas that soak up and store water and thereby reduce flood peaks. Wetland functions and benefits go hand in hand. Some like water quality improvement, flood damage reduction, and water storage are readily apparent. Other benefits are less tangible. Dr. Charles Nylon is an urban ecologist at the University of Missouri at Columbia. Well, people who live in cities often live in areas where there's very little natural green space. And so urban wetlands provide a unique opportunity for those folks to see a variety of open spaces with the plants and animal life that are attracted to them. And in many cities we're finding that urban planners are also recognizing this by incorporating these urban wetlands into their long-range plans. You know, in addition to these natural benefits, there are also a variety of economic benefits. For example, people buy things like binoculars, cameras, outdoor equipment, and nature guides that they use when they go to enjoy these open spaces. And finally, urban wetlands provide a benefit for scientific study. Botanists, zoologists, and ecologists all study the variety of plants and animals that occur in urban areas. As a biologist, uh, wetlands are, are always of interest because the kinds of things you find in them, plants and animals, are very different from the kinds of plants and animals all over the upland landscape around us. And we're perhaps more conscious of them as biologists because many of our wetlands have been impacted and those few that are left in very, very good condition become special places. The benefits of wetlands go beyond what can be measured in dollars and cents. What other values can you assess to our natural heritage? As Hugh Bird said, wetlands have a beauty all their own, a beauty that cannot be found elsewhere. Wetlands are educational. They make ideal classrooms for learning about the natural world. Wetlands are a place where children can get their feet wet, learning nature's secrets, and study the past to protect their future. One Missouri community that is taking advantage of this idea is Buckner, which is just east of Kansas City and Jackson County. Here, the Buckner Educational Wetland Project is taking shape under the direction of Ed Winfrey, with help from the Jackson County Soil and Water Conservation District, the Fort Osage School District, the City of Buckner, and many private citizens. Ed Winfrey, a farmer from Buckner, is working toward that goal. As a member of the project steering committee, he's deeply involved in the restoration of a natural wetland, which will be used as an outdoor classroom, 
a living museum, a special place where the plants and animals unique to the wetlands will help teachers illustrate complex ecological principles to their students. I grew up in this neighborhood and rode the school bus by this site when I was a kid. And uh, I didn't think as much about it then because there were more of these kinds of places around. And as time goes on, they seem to be slowly disappearing one by one. And I think it's, uh, it's valuable to save this land and, and so that my kids and their generation will have an opportunity to come out here and see what this kind of an ecosystem is really like. Uh, they're going to be the ones making decisions about land use uh, in the future. And it's really not fair to them to ask them to do that if they don't have a little bit of first-hand experience to see what this kind of a place is, is really like. One of the things that I talked about with the city leaders in Buckner was the fact that uh, of all the things that this project is, uh, maybe the most basic is, is that it's really a matter of quality of life. And to have a place like this for the people in Buckner and the Fort Osage kids and suburban and urban Kansas City kids to come and see a, a little postage stamp island of wildlife here uh, in what used to be an enormous sea of wildlife is an opportunity that uh, I think is meaningful and important that, uh, that they should have. And uh, we have a, a little bit of responsibility to at least to provide the opportunity for that to exist for them to come and see. With the loss of almost 90% of our state's wetland resources, we should all recognize the impact it has upon us. As wetlands disappear, the loss of valuable topsoil is accelerated. As wetland resources continue to be degraded, they lose their ability to improve water quality and to recharge groundwater supplies, which are important sources for drinking water. The once vast network of wetlands associated with our streams and rivers provided the natural flood protection that now requires costly artificial means of control. Missourians should recognize that wetlands improve the quality of their lives. Each of us should recognize the ecological significance of wetlands and their value to all of society. For wetlands are one of Missouri's vanishing resources.